Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're in part four, and in tonight's lesson, it'll be maybe a little bit more technical than some that we've had. That may surprise you. Uh, but the basic concepts are not so difficult. Uh, I do want to share some information because we're going to be looking at um, information that's in the DNA. And so, again, we are talking about this in terms of worldview. So I think it's worth reminding each time. The overall perspective from which one sees and interprets the world, a collection of beliefs about life and the universe held by an individual or group, and people naturally interpret evidence in a way that's consistent with their worldview. Now, when it comes to origins, which is the focus of our lessons here, there's two primary worldviews in our culture, and that is that which is widely promoted, which is materialistic and naturalistic, it's Darwinian evolution, and there is what's presented in Scripture and is historically what was widely taught and believed in this country, which is creation. So there's basically one set of evidence in the world. We all see the same world. We practice the same operational science. And again, most of my career uh, was involved in research, and I worked with many great scientists, highly qualified scientists. Um, the same kind of science that we practice in my workplace is practiced around the world. And we talk about operational science. That is that which can be practiced and you make observations and just careful uh, examination of evidence. Well, when it comes to looking at the world and tonight genetic information, that's, this is available for everyone to see. It comes down to interpretation. And so again, tonight you'll get a chance to look at some of the evidence that's there and you can make your own determination. We've covered several challenges to the Darwinian model. Tonight, we're exclusively going to focus on information that's found in the DNA. And then actually next week, we're kind of off to the races because we're going to attempt to briefly touch on a variety of topics just to introduce the concept and help you understand how they are also present challenges to the Darwinian worldview. So information content in DNA, genetic information. According to the National Human Genome Research Institute, a prestigious body, deoxyribonucleic acid, abbreviated DNA, is the molecule that carries genetic information for the development and functioning of an organism. Okay, so everyone is in agreement that DNA is jam-packed with information. The key question then is, what is the source of the genetic information? According to evolutionists, purely natural processes somehow caused ordinary chemicals to come together to produce DNA and all of the machinery needed to read it and to manufacture complex proteins. Thus far, no one has been able to provide any observational evidence or even a plausible case for how this is possible. According to the creationist model, the evidence strongly implies that there is an intelligent agent who's responsible for the information in DNA. And furthermore, the Bible that we have reveals who that intelligent agent is. Now, some inf definitions for information. And I've gone through, you know, half a dozen of these. The communication or reception of knowledge or intelligence. So what's implied there? Knowledge and intelligence, right? A message that gets transmitted from one place to another. It has a sender and a receiver and is sent along a medium or channel. Almost every definition that you come across when you explore information talks about knowledge. And knowledge implies intelligence, quite frankly. So it's quite easy to get from believing that there is genetic information, that there is a source of that information. It's quite a stretch to believe that random processes have generated complex, detailed information. Now, universal information. Werner Gitt received his doctorate in control engineering 
and for much of his career, he served as the director and professor at the German Federal Institute of Physics and Technology, and he oversaw the Department of Information Technology. So here's a guy, his PhD is in control engineering, and his whole career is based on information technology. He has examined the DNA and given this a lot of thought, and he has put forward what he calls laws of universal information. Now, notice when he talks about up at the first paragraph, universal information is symbolically encoded and abstractly represented. Now, that's, you have to get your mind around that a bit. The English language, which you're looking at right now, is a code. And you have been taught this code since you were young. And therefore, you don't even think about it as code. But it is. And so if, if I were to mention sheep, I could spell out S-H-E-E-P. And that's symbolically encoded. And it's abstractly represented. If I drew you a picture of a sheep, it wouldn't be not so abstract. You could look at it and say, oh, yeah, that's a sheep. But for writing the word sheep, it's symbolically encoded and it's abstractly represented. There's nothing in S-H-E-E-P that would make your mind think of sheep other than the fact that you understand the code and we're talking in the same code, right? So again, it's symbolically encoded, abstractly represented. And we'll look at some more examples of this in a minute. He goes on then and he says, universal information is non-material and a fundamental entity. Now you can go home and think about that, but information is not material. Information is non-material. It's communicated through material means. Like even now I'm speaking and there are uh, sound waves that are materially leaving my mouth and striking your ear. But the information that's encoded is actually a mental thing. A purely material entity, he says, cannot create a non-material entity. Universal information cannot be created by purely random processes, and that's exactly what Darwinian evolution says. Universal information can only be created by an intelligent sender. And he goes from there with a deduction. The information conveyed by the DNA, RNA, protein synthesizing system is universal information. Therefore, it must have been created by an intelligent sender. And if you want to dig a lot deeper, there's a book that he wrote that you can get. And he has a website as well. So getting back to the idea of symbolically encoded and abstractly represented, well, this is the exact same information you just saw. But unless you know Nepali, all you are seeing on here is yellow and white and squiggles, and you see that there's some repeating units, but information is not being communicated to you, right? You understand the English code. Now, there's plenty of codes. So the spoken word is a code. The written word is a code. Some of us that have been around a little while learned the Morse code. I learned this as a youth. I was tested on it in high school. How many people in high school get tested on Morse code these days? And everybody now, you know what dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot is, right? And what does that mean? Save our souls. That's a distress signal. If you wrote out dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 that means I need help. Okay, that's the Morse code. It's fallen by the wayside, dare I say. How about Braille? Now, Braille, again, is a code, and it's, it's physical in the sense that you've got raised dots on either paper or on plastic, and those who understand the code can read, right, and understand. How about Marine? There may be a few people in here who understand Marine signal flags. Uh, I wouldn't, but they're there. So the same information can be transmitted through a variety of codes, okay? But the information itself is non-material. The mechanisms are material. How about machine code? Uh, there may be a few people in here that are familiar with how computers are programmed, but it's written in machine code. And in a second, I'll ask you to compare the machine code with the DNA code and see which one is more sophisticated. This is the best that people have come up with so far. So looking again, this is the technical part. Just a reminder, 
DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, it's a double helix. And it's represented here towards the right in color form. And you see the outer part, or kind of like the legs of the twisted ladder. These are repeating units of sugars and phosphate. So sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. They're not communicating information. They're simply there holding the rungs, and the rungs have what are called the base pairs. And, and this is actually where the code is written. And there's only four letters or chemical entities that are a part of the rungs of the ladder. You see them abbreviated. Cytosine is the C, guanine the G, adenine the A, and thymine the T. And what's particularly significant in the DNA, these are paired so that, as you can see in the color, red and yellow at the top. So A always pairs with T, T always pairs with A. And if you look at the color, the green and the blue, blue pairs with green, G, that is C with G, and G with C. And what's kind of notable about this, if you actually separate the rungs of the DNA into two different halves, because always the T matches with A, you can build back the other side of the DNA because of the consistency of what pairs with what. So one DNA can be split, and you can immediately form two, and that's what happens with cell division. All right? Now, um, information is found in the DNA. And here's just an interesting tidbit. Back in 1960, we started in this country a program, program called SETI, S-E-T-I that search for extraterrestrial intelligence, right? We've been spending millions of dollars since 1960 all the way through now, over 60 years, millions of dollars a year. And what's happening? They're searching the heavens for coded information. They're using these large radio telescopes, and there's actually been, I think, over 100 projects now they're looking for coded information. Why? They say, if we found, find coded information, that's evidence of intelligence. So you turn the microscope into, I mean, the telescope to microscope, and what do you find? The most complex coded information in the known universe in the DNA. And yet the materialists say, no intelligence. Uh, is that rational? Now, let's talk a little bit about transcription and translation. Again, this is the technical part. Back in the early days when I was in, in uh, school, the understanding of DNA was fairly basic. And people talked about the fact that the DNA molecule could be opened up and the codes could be read. And the code here, where we in English have an alphabet of 26 letters, right? A through Z. DNA is different in that they've only got these four chemical entities. But what, they, what happens in DNA, when you're reading in order to eventually make a protein, three of those base pairs are read simultaneously. And so in position one, you have the potential for four different bases. In position two, you have the potential for four bases, and, potential, and three, four bases. So in combination, that's four times four times four. That's 64 possible combinations. And the way it's read is, again, a group of three, a group of three, a group of three. And each one of those, which we'll look at, sends a message as to which amino acid is ultimately picked and combined in order to make a polypeptide or a protein. Now, again, in the early days of understanding DNA, people were really transfixed on the fact that the information was present in the DNA to make proteins. And what they subsequently found was that only 2 to 3% of all of the DNA coded for proteins. And, and we'll have a slide on this. Subsequently, they said, well, the other 97, 98% is junk. That's totally false now. Uh, what, what we actually know is Somewhere between 75 to 90% of all of the DNA is transcribed, that is converted from DNA into messenger RNA, but only about 2 to 3% of that ends up exiting out of the nucleus and going to a ribosome in order to make a protein. 
What we've subsequently learned is the vast majority of the DNA is packed full of information, but it's doing other things. Now, if you were with us last time, just one illustration, we saw, saw the assembly of the flagellum. So the components of the flagellum are like the proteins. That's the 2 to 3% of the DNA, the making of the physical protein. The information for how to assemble that is also found in the DNA. And all of the information for telling one cell, now you become a bone cell, and telling another cell, you become a liver cell, and another, you become a nerve cell, all that kind of information is also found inside the DNA. So most of the DNA contains genetic information that does not ultimately end up as protein. So the, the basic steps are transcription, and we now know that at least 75 and probably 90% of all the DNA is transcribed, and that means it's, it's transferred and becomes an RNA. And then the RNA, if it leaves the nucleus and it goes to a ribosome, it gets translated in order to make a protein. And an interesting thing about this design is the DNA is precious. And so we talked about how it is enclosed in histones in order to protect it. If the DNA were the size of your hair and you stretched it out, it would be more than 30 miles long. Okay? And all of that is packed jammed into a very tiny part of a cell that you can't even see without a microscope. Okay? And so the DNA needs to be protected, so it's enshrouded in these histones. But when information is needed from the DNA, it's opened up and it's read, and a copy is made of messenger RNA. Now, that messenger RNA, its life is finite. It's only going to be needed for a very short amount of time. So this is kind of like going to a library, and you go into a section where they've got old books, and they don't want you checking out those books, right? So you can go into that, that reading room, and you can look at it, and maybe they'll allow you to even make some photocopies of it, but you can't take the original out. And that's what's happening inside the cell. The DNA is inside, it's protected, but when that information is needed, a copy of it is made as messenger RNA. That messenger RNA is then taken out of the nucleus into the ribosomes or elsewhere in the cell, and then that information is used. And then that, that messenger RNA can be discarded. Okay? So transcription, translation. As much as 90% of DNA is transcribed, but only 2 to 3% is translated. But all of that's useful. And by the way, a part of that DNA that's neither transcribed uh, or used like this, it's scaffolding. You're going to see in the video the way that the chromosomes fold. Sometimes they need extra space in order to get in the right orientation. And so there are some stretches of the DNA that are simply there to create the space so that things line up the way they need to be lined up inside the nucleus. We'll see video for, we have got two good videos tonight. So this is now called the standard genetic code. Uh, this is, again, the way the codons, a codon is a group of three base pairs, the way that they are read. So if you look at the top left, if you had like U, 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 that would be a code to say, give me a phenylalanine. If it was UUA, it would be give me a leucine. And so you can see in here that there are 64 possible combinations, and they all, and if they're being uh, translated into protein, this is the code that's used. And this is the standard code. Now, interestingly, um, there was a time that evolutionists said there's only one code, and that's proof positive that. All of this came from a single cell in the beginning, and so they prove, that proves evolution. Well, we now know there's actually more than 30 different languages, 30 different codes. There is a standard code, the most widely used, and it's considered an optimized code. That's what's in you and me, but there are other organisms that actually have a different table, okay? So that's actually an interesting thing to consider and ponder. Talking about the standard genetic code. It's considered now, it's been studied in great detail. It's an optimized design. In fact, researchers have suggested that of all the possible codes, the standard DNA code, which is found in the majority of organisms, appears to be the very best possible. So it's been optimized. There's millions of possibilities of codes, and this one 
and we won't get into the chemistry of why, but this one appears to be optimized. Okay? Moving on. As far as the 20 amino acids that are found in life, again, I said one codon sends a message, give me like a glycine. You can see the top left one there. The part that's got the, the two O's and the H, that's the carboxylic acid, the COOH. Some of you remember that from your chemistry days. And what's next to it, the NH2 area, that's the amino part. So all of these, uh, you'll notice, have those two components. That's why they're called amino acids. But what's different, the glycine actually, where you see the bin, actually has just a hydrogen. And next to it, the alanine has a methyl group. But you've got these 20. Now, there are potentially hundreds of amino acids that could be made. But these are the 20 that are found in life. And some of them they call hydrophobic. That means they're attracted to water and others are excuse me, hydrophobic is repels from water. Polar is attracted to water. But all of your proteins are made up of these particular amino acids joined together. A typical protein in your body has somewhere between 10,000 and 50,000 amino acid units. There are some proteins that are less than 1,000. There are some proteins that approach 2 million. But a typical protein would have, again, somewhere between 10,000 and 20 or 100,000 or so of these in one protein. And by the way, your body has about 300,000 different proteins in it. Now, how much information is stored in DNA? In the photo above, the series of books in the bookshelves are the first printed copy of the human genome displayed in the Medicine Now room at the Wellcome Collection in London. The 3.2 billion units of DNA code are collected into more than 100 volumes. So this is the first printout of the human genome. So more than 100 volumes. Each is 1,000 pages long in type so small that it's barely legible. Now, if you were an expert typist, a person would have to type for more than 50 years to, a, to complete the job at a relatively quick rate of for eight hours a day. So if that was your task to copy that and you were a typist, it would take you a lifetime to do it. We now know that your cells can make a full copy in somewhere between one and eight hours. So when they first did this, again, it took about 12 years and they spent, two, I think, $2.7 billion. But given the technology available, they actually could only decipher about 90% of the human DNA, and it's only as recent as 2022 that a true complete set of the human DNA has now been made. Junk DNA. The first time I gave a talk like this, it was to a group of high school and college students, and one of the college students was pursuing her MD, PhD at an Ivy League school, and she came to me afterwards and said, you know, if the things you're talking about are all true, why is the majority of the DNA junk, because that's what she was being taught in her Ivy League medical school. This goes back about 12 or so years ago. Well, I told her then the fact that we as people and scientists don't yet understand the function of all the DNA is not a reason to call, call so much of it junk. Give it time, and we'll begin to understand it. So here it says, once and not so long ago, received wisdom. And this was dri ev evolution driven. And the people at the time said, because DNA is experimenting continuously and trying to come up, if you will, with new combinations and new proteins, it needs a vast amount of room in order to mutate and experiment. So this was an explanation. And so it was not actively pursued. And, and I would say evolutionary thinking has retarded the advancement of science. So, but once and not so long ago, received wisdom was that most of the human genome, perhaps as much as 99%, was junk. If this junk had a role, it was just to space out the remaining 1%, the genes in which instructions about how to make proteins are encoded in a useful way in the cell nucleus. That, it now seems, was about as far from the truth as it is possible to be. The decade or so since the completion of the human genome project has shown that lots of junk must indeed have a function. And as I just shared, this is a rapidly advancing area of science. And we now know that 
as much as 90% of the DNA, again, is being transcribed and it has function. And a matter of fact, many of those parts of the DNA that are transcribed that don't end up making proteins, they're finding them far more often copied and used inside the cell. They're much more active than those parts of the DNA that are being used to make proteins. Now, a similar analogy to this, if you were of an older generation, you may have studied in your school textbooks that the human body had as many as 100 vestigial organs. Even some of these were thought of in Darwin's day, things like the appendix, thin, thin, things like the tailbone, uh, wisdom teeth, different parts of the body that were said to be leftovers of our evolutionary past and useless. Well, no modern textbook talks about vestigial organs because we've now figured out their function. So it was ignorance that said that those organs didn't have function, just like ignorance said that much of the DNA is junk, but eventually the science catches up. So that's where we are today. How is it that about 22,000 genes code for greater than 300,000 different proteins? Now, this is a, was a mystery. In the early days of thinking, people considered DNA as simply a linear string of these nucleobases. And you would read three here, three here, three here, and you would come up with a section. And that was called a gene. And that's what people thought of. And so they basically thought one gene per protein. What we've now come to see, and this is really well shown in the videos, this, I think the second one in particular, these pieces are cut from one gene and another gene and another gene, and they're spliced together. So an individual component that's found in one gene could end up in as many as 30 to 40 different proteins. So the, the DNA is taking advantage of the fact that you don't have to have redundancy everywhere. It can actually take from here and from here and here and put them together to make a, a new protein. So cells go through a process called alternate splicing, where genes are spliced and combined at different times and in different ways to produce many different proteins. Now, here's a little illustration from one of my textbooks in college. It was called Transport Phenomena. Now, why would I burden you with this? Well, some chemical engineers are pretty creative. You know, they've got time on their hands, so what do you do? So if you read the first letter of every sentence in the preface, you would see it says, this book is dedicated to O.A. Hugen. Okay, so you've got the information that's found to the un untrained reader, which is just the preface, but for those who were in the know, you could actually read the first letter of every sentence and it's a different message. Well, that's how DNA is. It's got places that are read in multiple ways and times and put together. And we'll, again, the videos will show this some more. Here's another example. Ten animals I slam in a net. Now, that seems pretty silly. What's interesting about this is you can read it forward and you can read it backward. I used to live in Sims, Alabama, S-E-M-M-E-S. -E -M -M -E <laughs> you can spell it either way. <laughs> um, that's the way DNA is. We fa actually figured out that both strands, both sides of the DNA are actually being used. This is kind of like being able to take a book and read it forward, and you have a novel, and then you start reading from the last word, and you read it backwards, and you've got a different novel. That would be quite amazing, wouldn't it be? Well, that's how DNA is. It's read forwards, and it's read backwards also. So we now understand that not just one, but both strands, the sense and the anti-sense of DNA are fully transcribed. Now here's where we go to our first video, and hopefully this will play well for you. The problem of biological origins has, for a very long time, I would say, has been a real deep interest to me just because of the scale of the problem, the importance of it. Uh, where did we come from? Uh, what are, why are we here? Uh, all that kind of uh, question. Uh, probed from the point of view of natural science. During the late 1960s and throughout the 70s and early 80s, Dean Kenyon was one of the leading chemical evolutionary theorists in the world. And like others in his field, he was trying to explain how life on Earth began through a purely natural process. In 1969, Kenyon co-authored an important book on the origin of life. 
Gary Steinman and myself thought that uh, if we were to pull together um, in uh, all of the uh, lines of empirical uh, evidence that had accumulated by the uh, mid to late uh, 60s in one continuous uh, argument, we were very enthusiastic about the possibilities uh, for explaining uh, the origin of the main life-building elements. Despite his optimism, Kenyon faced a significant problem. To explain how life began, he first had to account for the origin of the essential building blocks of every cell that has existed on Earth. Large, complex molecules called proteins. Proteins have a wide range of function in the cell, everything from structural requirements in terms of scaffolding of the cell, the cytoskeleton, to enzymes where they're actually processing molecules to harvest energy or to build components of the cell. Proteins do pretty much all of the jobs inside of the cell, except for storing genetic information. That's left to the DNA, the RNA. But all the day-to-day -day jobs, cleaning up the cell, making energy, it's all proteins. Kenyon knew that proteins would have been as important to the first life as they are to living cells today. He also recognized the complexity of their construction. By the 1960s, scientists had determined that even simple cells are made of thousands of different types of proteins. And the function of these molecules derives from their highly complex three-dimensional shapes. The irregular shapes of some proteins allow them to catalyze or trigger chemical reactions because of the hand and glove fit that they have with other molecules in the cell while other protein molecules form interlocking structural components. The individual parts of a bacterial motor, like this ring structure, are each made of either a single protein molecule or an assembly of proteins fitted together into a specific shape. These proteins are, in turn, made of smaller chemical units called amino acids that are linked together in long chains. There is a very great degree of intricacy of architecture down in the cell units in these protein-forming amino acids. In nature, 20 different types of amino acids are used to construct protein chains. Biologists have compared them to the 26 letters of the English alphabet. Alphabetic letters can be arranged in a huge number of possible combinations and it's the sequential arrangement of the letters that determines whether you have meaningful words and sentences. If the letters are arranged correctly, you'll get meaningful text. But if they're not arranged correctly, you'll get gibberish. And the same principle applies for amino acids and proteins. There are at least 30,000 distinct types of proteins each made of a different combination of the same 20 amino acids. They are arranged, like letters, to form chains, often hundreds of units long. If the amino acids are sequenced correctly, then the chain will fold into a functioning protein. Proteins are arranged with their amino acids in such a way that the amino acids collapse on each other into an architecture that is pre-programmed by the order of the amino acids. It folds into a certain structure and that structure can do a certain function. So all proteins in the cell have a certain three-dimensional pattern that's based on the arrangement of amino acids in the chain. This arrangement is critical. For if the amino acids are incorrectly sequenced, a useless chain forms and instead of folding into a protein, it will be destroyed in the cell. Proteins, like written languages or computer codes, have a high degree of specificity. The function of the whole depends upon the precise arrangement of the individual parts. But what produces the precise sequencing of amino acids that gives rise to the specific shapes and functions of proteins? During the 1950s and 60s, Discoveries about protein structure forced biologists to confront this mystery. Dean Kenyon believed he could solve it. In his book, Biochemical Predestination, Kenyon and his co-author, Gary Steinman, proposed an intriguing theory. Kenyon wrote, 
life might have been biochemically predestined by the properties of attraction that exist between its chemical parts, particularly between amino acids in proteins. At the time that biochemical predestination came out, I and my uh, co-author were totally convinced that we had the scientific explanation for origins. Kenyon proposed that the chemical properties of the amino acids caused them to be attracted to each other, forming the long chains that became the first proteins, the most important components in the living cell. And this meant that life was effectively inevitable, predestined by nothing more than chemistry. Many scientists embraced Kenyon's ideas, and over the next 20 years, biochemical predestination became a best-selling text on the theory of chemical evolution. Yet five years after the book's publication, Kenyon quietly began to doubt the plausibility of his own theory. It was during that whole period of time that my doubts about certain aspects of the evolutionary account became apparent. When coming into contact with a powerful counter-argument given to me by one of my students, and I could not refute that counter-argument. Kenyon was challenged to explain how the first proteins could have been assembled without the help of genetic instructions. In living cells today, chains of amino acids are not formed directly by forces of attraction between their parts, the scenario Kenyon envisioned on the early Earth. Instead, another large molecule within the cell stores instructions for sequencing the amino acids in proteins. It is called DNA. Initially, Kenyon believed that proteins could have formed directly from amino acids without any DNA assembly instructions. And, and that's why so many scientists were excited about his theory. But the more he and others learned about the properties of amino acids and proteins, the more he began to doubt that proteins could self-assemble without DNA. In DNA, Kenyon encountered a molecule with a property he could not explain through natural processes or locked securely within its double helix structure is a wealth of information in the form of precisely sequenced chemicals that scientists represent with the letters A, C, T, and G. In a written language, information is communicated by a precise arrangement of letters. In the same way, the instructions necessary to assemble amino acids into proteins are conveyed by the sequences of chemicals arranged along the spine of the DNA. This chemical code has been called the language of life, and it is the most densely packed and elaborately detailed assembly of information in the known universe. Like other scientists working on the origin of life, Kenyon realized he had two choices. Either he had to explain where these genetic assembly instructions came from, or he had to explain how proteins could have arisen directly from amino acids without DNA in the primordial oceans. And in the end, he realized he could do neither. It's an enormous problem how you could get together in one tiny submicroscopic volume of the primitive ocean all of the uh, hundreds of different molecular components you would need in order for a self-replicating cycle to be established. And so my doubts about whether amino acids could order themselves into uh, meaningful biological sequences on their own without pre-existing genetic material being present just reached, uh, I guess for me, the intellectual breaking point uh, sometime near the, the end of the decade of the 70s. As Kenyon reevaluated his theory, new biochemical discoveries further weakened his conviction that amino acids could have organized themselves into proteins. The more I conducted my own studies, including a period of time at NASA Ames Research uh, Center, uh, the more it became apparent that there were multiple difficulties with uh, the chemical evolution account. And uh, further uh, experimental work showed that amino acids do not have the ability to order themselves uh, into any biologically meaningful sequences. Faced with mounting difficulties in his own theory and a growing body of scientific data about the importance of DNA, Kenyon was forced to confront the absolute necessity of genetic information. 
The more I thought about the alternative that was being presented in the criticism and the enormous problem that all of us who worked on this field had neglected to address, the problem of the origin of genetic information itself, then I really had to reassess my whole uh, position regarding, uh, regarding origins. For Dean Kenyon, a new question became the focus of his search for life's origin. What was the source of the biological information in DNA? If one could get at the origin of the uh, messages, the encoded messages within the living machinery, then you would really be on to something far more intellectually satisfying than this chemical evolution theory. Yet Kenyon realized that he faced a narrowing set of options. By the 1970s, most researchers had rejected the idea that the information necessary to build the first cell originated by chance alone. To understand why, consider the difficulty of generating just two lines of Shakespeare's play Hamlet by dropping Scrabble letters onto a tabletop then considered that the specific genetic instructions required to build the proteins in even the simplest one-celled organism would fill hundreds of pages of printed text. Of course, a serious origin of life biologists did not believe that life had arisen by chance alone. Instead, they envisioned natural selection acting on random variations among chemicals to produce the first life. But there was a problem with this proposal. By definition, natural selection could not have functioned before the existence of the first living cell. For it can only act upon organisms capable of replicating themselves. Cells equipped with DNA that pass on their genetic changes to future generations. Without DNA, there is no self-replication. But without self-replication, there is no natural selection. So you can't use natural selection to explain the origin of DNA without assuming the existence of the very thing you're trying to explain. Chance, natural selection, and his own theory of self-organization had all failed to explain the origin of genetic information. Now Kenyon saw only one alternative. We have not the slightest chance of a chemical evolutionary origin for even the simplest uh, of cells. So the concept of the intelligent design of life was immensely attractive to me and made a great deal of sense as it very closely matched the multiple discoveries in molecular biology. In the years since Kenyon's rejection of chemical evolution, Science has revealed the details of an entire system of information processing that bears the hallmarks of intelligent design. With computer animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, 
the process of translation begins. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. This is absolutely mind-boggling to perceive at this scale of size such a uh, finely tuned um, apparatus, a device that's, uh, that bears the marks of intelligent design and manufacture. And we have the details of an immensely complex molecular realm of genetic information processing. And it's exactly this new realm of molecular genetics where we see the most compelling evidence of design on the Earth. So, continuing on, <clears throat> you're familiar with the human chromosomes. So, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. That's 23 times 2, 46. The difference between male and female is the 23rd chromosome. So, the female has two X, whereas the male has an X and a Y. All people on the earth, if you don't consider the 23rd chromosome for now, all people on earth are 99.9% .9 identical. I mean, all the differences that you see are a tiny, tiny fraction of the total 3.2 billion base pairs. You know, we're very clearly all related, and it goes back, even scientists today say, to one man and to one woman. They know that. <clears throat> we're going to be looking at another video. We'll see how this goes. Um, but it focuses on the three-dimensional architecture. This is brand new knowledge. These are things that have just been learned in recent years. So... Those 23 pair, prayers, pairs of chromosomes fold in the nucleus, right? And not only does each chromosome have a specified position in the nucleus, but genes that are used together are generally found next to each other in three-dimensional space, even when they are on different chromosomes. One exon that is a part of a gene can be used in a combination with up to 33 different genes located on 14 different chromosomes. And what, what's going to be pointed out in the video is what we've been learning about DNA. Uh, you can think of it as four-dimensional. Now, just do a quick little mental exercise with me here. So in reading English, we read a line, right? You read a line and a line and a line, right? That's one dimension. And that's how people thought of DNA in the beginning. Well, now just mentally imagine a crossword puzzle. So now you've got two dimensions, right? You've got like one letter that's used in two different dimensions, and you read on, you know, two different ways. Now, I'll take another step forward in your mind. You've probably never seen this, but imagine a three-dimensional crossword puzzle. It's conceivable, right? You could have a cube, and you could have words on all the faces, right? And then imagine one step further, it's kind of like a Rubik's Cube where you could adjust it and create new three-dimensional crossword puzzles by twisting it. 
Now, if mentally you can begin to grasp that, you can begin to see a bit of what DNA is really like. The first dimension we'll learn about is, again, the single strand of a DNA molecule. The second dimension is called the interaction network, where, again, one piece here is added to another piece here is added to another piece here. The third dimension gets into the, the three-dimensional architecture, the way everything folds together. And the fourth dimension is how that folding changes with time and based on where the DNA is, is in your body. So the way that the nucleus, those chromosomes would fold that might be in your liver would be different than the way they might fold together um, in your heart or in your brain, okay? And so we're going to watch a video that, that the, the person who's being interviewed here, uh, uh, Robert Carter, he is a PhD marine biologist from the University of Miami. He works for the Creation Ministries International. And it's just an interview where he's talking about some of the things that we've been learning about the complexity of DNA. What are we finding now as we're studying genetics? What are, what are kind of the things that we see now that we didn't see 50 years ago? Well, 50 years ago, they had the simple idea that you have a gene and a gene makes a protein. That's been blown out of the water. We now know that genes are involved in making dozens, if not hundreds of proteins and different pieces of genes are used in different proteins at different times in the cell cycle, different times in life, under different conditions, in different cells. Most of your cells in your body, they produce similar proteins and other cells, but they're different. Huh. So your brain cells actually produce different versions of proteins than your liver cells produce. So how is that possible? I mean, how, is it, how do they do that? It's, it's dynamic programming. Hmm. You have a gene, and this piece is used over here or over there or over there. And there's little teeny programs inside the DNA that control when and where and how to use that piece. Mm -hmm. But just recently I read a paper about um, actually shifting of the information in the genes. So if you start at, at letter number one, you can read out this information. Yeah. If you start at read, no, letter number two, you get a to totally different information. How on earth did that evolve like that? I mean, if you think of, um, if you read a story, maybe you're, you're reading a story talking about some swashbuckling pirate. Mm -hmm. But if you start the second letter, letter, it's a chocolate chip cookie recipe. We can't write that. We, there's no way we could intelligently program multiple levels of information into the same story. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see in life. And if we can't do it intelligently, it's not going to happen randomly. We're talking about something that is beyond imagination in terms of the complexity. Yeah. Even from the standpoint of the kind of things we've uh, done with software, and we've done some amazing things with software, but yeah. that, that appears to be is, is not even close to what you're talking about. I like to say the genome is four-dimensional. Hmm. In software, we write in lines of code. Correct. Well, in mathematics, we learned a line is a one-dimensional object. It right. just has length. Mm -hmm. So you could actually take a computer program and just write from left to right for millions of characters. Now, on our screens, we put carriage returns in there so we can read it. But the computer doesn't know that. It ignores the carriage returns. It's just a line. Well, DNA is a line. So in the naive concept of DNA, we had a, a line that had information in it. Mm -hmm. But it's not simple like that. Because this piece of DNA makes a little protein that comes over here and sticks on this piece of DNA over here, which turns on or turns off a gene. Oh my goodness, it's like self-modifying code. Oh, it's worse than that. Because this piece <laughs> of DNA over here makes just an RNA that goes over here and interferes with this gene's RNA. They stick together, they interfere, they conflict with one another, they turn things on, they turn things off. And if you want to draw that out, you need a sheet of paper, a very big sheet of paper. You'd have to write all the letters of DNA out on all three billion of them. Uh, it would take, I, I calculated, about 850 Bibles as one human genome. And then you have to draw lines or arrows from one part to another part because this part turns this part off, this part interferes with this, this part enhances this. It's this huge two-dimensional interaction network. And that's where you have a two-dimensional genome. So it sounds like, I mean, let me stop here All for right. a second because this is really amazing to think about this because um, I think in terms of a computer program that it's fairly static. I mean, yeah. the instructions are there, but you're talking about a program that is reprogramming itself, oh. that's modifying its own instructions. Oh, wait till I get to the fourth dimension. Oh, okay. It's because of the third dimension first. The, the genome also folds into a three-dimensional shape. 
And so a, a 3D, the third dimension, is, is actually the shape. And the genes that are buried inside this ball of DNA, they're not active, they're turned off. The genes that are exposed are the ones that are used. So whoever programmed that, that string oh. knew when it folded up which genes will be available at what time. I say, are you saying that when this instruction set folds onto itself, it creates a whole new set of instructions? Yeah, absolutely. And That's mind-boggling. The information in that first dimension, that linear string, has to be organized in such a way that when it folds into the third dimension, it still works. Oh, well, that's amazing. But it's, it's, it's so, it's amazing. When, when they first sequenced the human genome, some scientists sat down, they did something I would have done. They said, okay, let's look at genes that we know are used in a biochemical pathway. They might like 10 genes in a row to convert this into something over here. Well, if I was programmed it, I would have stuck them right next to each other in the genome. So they looked and they weren't next to each other. They're random. They said, these genes are used on different chromosomes, they're backwards, they're forwards, they're just, they said, look at all the evidence of evolution, it's just junk. Random changes uh, over millions of years, throw all this stuff together willy-nilly, it's just nonsense. And we've heard that a lot. We've, we've heard, heard that a whole lot. Junk DNA. Yes, but then someone figured out how to look at the genome in three dimensions. First of all, they realized the genome folds in a fractal pattern. Hmm. And it's beautiful but it's in a fractal pattern that doesn't make knots. And so it folds up, and when they figured out where the, the genes were, genes that are used together are next to each other in 3D space. Oh, Even if they're on different chromosomes, when the chromosomes fold, they bring those two genes next to each other, and usually this cluster of genes is right next to a nuclear pore. So when God programmed these genes, he knew that when he had to turn all these genes on, he needed them in three-dimensional space next to each other. So the whole biochemical pathway can be turned on. The little things are, are copied into RNA. The RNA comes outside the nucleus, it's turned into protein. Voila. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, so you, you've about blown my mind with that, but you said there's another dimension. Here. Oh yeah, the fourth dimension is time. And how does that work? The genome changes shape over time. Remember I said the genes, some genes are buried yeah. and some are exposed. Well, you need those buried genes at some time. And so at different stages of development or sleeping versus waking or stress versus non-stress or after you, maybe you eat something that's bad for you and your liver says, I can get rid of that toxin. Now your earlobes, they don't care. They don't know what to do, but your liver says, I know what to do. The chromosomes in the liver will change shape expose that new protein gene, make copies of it, build a brand new protein that can kill off that toxin, and when it's not needed anymore, they'll change shape again and fold back. Oh my goodness. So what you're saying is that we could look at this, I mean, from a very simple perspective, and come up with the phrase called junk DNA. Yes. And then we can even look at it when it's folded, even though that is complex, and say, oh, there's still some strange things in there. But <laughs> You're saying if it's not being used, we might not recognize its importance. True. It is. But some of the information in the genome is like scaffolding in the building. The reason this piece of DNA is here is because when it falls into the three dimensions, it needs these two genes to be next to each other. Right. So this stretch here might not have a functional protein associated with it, but it still has a function. It's very important. So most of the so-called junk DNA has been brought into the functional category, just not in the way the standard paradigm predicted. And it's funny because the more amazing, the more complex things become, the harder it is for the standard paradigm to explain it. Mm. That three-dimensional ball of DNA changes over the fourth dimension. But the interaction networks in that second dimension, they change because this gene turns off. Well, that affects this one over here. This one no longer talks to that one over there. But it's, worse, it's, it's even more complicated than that. It's the first dimension, that linear string, yeah. the program changes. Uh, that computer software people, they don't like programs no. that dynamically rewrite themselves. You get all sorts of catastrophe, but we've learned that in the human brain, brain cells have different genomes to other brain cells. There are these little pieces of DNA that they actually, they make a circle and they pop out and they go over and they float somewhere else in the genome and they stick themselves in there and they turn genes on and they turn genes off. And now we have different pieces of DNA in different brain cells, and that directs 
what type of brain cell it will become. But our liver cells, they have different genomes also. There's a lot of chromosomal duplications that happen in the liver. Because if you need a biochemical pathway and a lot of it, well, make extra copies of those protein genes. But different liver cells have different copies of different chromosomes. And we've learned that in the mouse embryo, there's a jumping gene, a junk piece of DNA, an ancient viral infection, the standard paradigm says, which is boulder dash. It's not true. Because this little piece of DNA has to excise itself and jump around in the mouse embryo to turn genes on and turn genes off. And if you deactivate that little piece of DNA, you don't get development. It stops. So it's necessary in the mouse. It's probably something similar also probably cool. happens in us. Huh. Dynamic programming. All three levels change in the fourth level time. Rob, that's, that's, uh, that's so far beyond anything that we know, even in our most complex software systems, that it, it's almost beyond imagination to think that someone would look at that and say it all happened by chance. Yes, and it only brings glory to God. It does. Because the more complex it becomes, the less possible it is to explain with natural, simple, mutational processes. And it, we realize that God is so far above us in intelligence we don't program computers like that because we're not that smart. Mm. But he made us in his image. We're good at copying things. I predict that, that computers in the future are going to be different because of what we're learning in the genome. Mm -hmm. Well, we've done that in the past. And we were talking earlier about how man has looked at uh, the flight of birds and studied them aerodynamically and from that we've been able to create aircraft. Yes. But it's hard for me right now to think that what you're talking about that we could even come close to replicating. Not yet. Not with any technology we have right now. We are limited to silicon chips right now and that is so incredibly primitive compared to the technology that God engineered directly into life. Again, a lot of this information is quite new. I mean, it was not known 15 years ago. Um, and reflecting back on the video earlier also, you saw words from two people. Dean Kenyon, who was one of the leading chemical evolutionists who wrote the textbook on chemical evolution, who confronted with evidence eventually reached what he called the breaking point where he could no longer believe in the materialistic worldview. And he had to embrace the obvious that there's an intelligent designer. On the other hand, you saw the quote from Francis Crick, Nobel Prize laureate saying, biologists must continually remind themselves that what they see was not designed. That's basically saying, faced with the evidence that it's designed, because I'm committed to a materialist worldview, I will keep telling myself and my students to believe in the materialist worldview. So let's look at a few other things before we close out. This from Werner Gitt I thought was interesting. He says, every spider is a virtual genius. It plans its web like an architect. It then carries out this plan like the proficient weaver it is. It is also a chemist who can synthesize silk employing a computer-controlled manufacturing process and then use that silk for spinning the spider is so proficient that it seems to have completed courses in structural engineering, chemistry, architecture, and information science. But we know this is not the case. So who instructed it? Where did it obtain this specialized knowledge? Who was its advisor? Here's another thing to consider. Your body. 3.2 billion base pairs, we've talked about that already, and we now know that there are over 300,000 different unique proteins in you. Trillions of cells, we've said 50 trillion to 100 trillion cells. And what about your brain? 100 billion neurons, 500 trillion nerve connections, processing capacity of 100 trillion instructions per second, 1 million new nerve connections per second count off 60 seconds, that would be 60 million new nerve connections. Psalm 139, you made all the 
delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous and how well I know it. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They are innumerable. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of the sand. And when I wake up in the morning, you're still with me. You can remember that tomorrow when you wake up. A couple of verses and we'll close out. So early, I began this by saying the key question, what is the source of genetic information? According to evolutionists, Purely natural processes somehow caused ordinary chemicals to come together to produce DNA and all the machinery needed to read it and to manufacture complex proteins. And thus far, no one has offered any observable evidence or come up with a plausible case for this happening. But according to the creation model, and the evidence strongly supports this, there is an intelligent agent and the scriptures reveal who this was. So consider John 1. In the beginning was the Logos, or the divine wisdom. The Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And thanks to Miriam Webster, he, they define Logos, the divine wisdom, manifest in creation, in government, in redemp- redemption of the world. And then this one closing passage from Colossians 1 Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before God made anything at all and is supreme over all creation. Christ is the one through whom God created everything in heaven and earth. He made the things that we can see and the things that we can't. Everything has been created through him and for him. He existed before everything, before everything else began, and he holds all of creation together. So the source of the information that we find in DNA, according to Scripture, is Jesus Christ himself, the Logos, the divine wisdom of God.